Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about Slack, S-L-A-A-C, that's Stateless Address Auto Configuration. In IPv6, our normal hosts, like usually our desktop computers, can be assigned their IPv6 addresses through either static addressing, where the administrator goes on each host individually and manually puts an IP address on there, or through DHCP v6, which is equivalent to DHCP and IPv4, or through Slack, which there is no equivalent for in IPv4. Our DHCP servers, if we're using DHCP, track the MAC address to IP address assignments of the IP addresses that they have given out. So they're keeping state information about the state of what IP addresses they gave out, what MAC address that that maps to, so that is stateful addressing. With Slack, which is stateless address auto configuration, hosts learn the Slack 64 subnet that their IPv6 interface is on from the local router that's also on that link, and then the host uses that information to generate its own IPv6 address usually based on the EUI64 address, so similar to what we did with the routers earlier. However, modern operating systems don't use that standardized EUI64 method because that raises privacy concerns because PCs can be tracked by their MAC address. So modern operating systems like modern versions of Windows use a different method to generate the 64-bit host portion of the address, which is completely randomized. The router, when you do this, when you're using Slack, does not track which hosts have which IP address. So it doesn't track the IP address to MAC address mapping. So that is stateless addressing as opposed to the stateful addressing when the IP addresses are given out by DHCP. When a global unicast IPv6 address is configured on a router interface, then router advertisements, which advertise the 64-bit network portion of the address on that interface, are sent out by the router by default. It's sent out using ICMP, and it's sent to the all nodes multicast address using the interface's link local address as the source address. So that gets sent out to everybody on the local link. So that's how the hosts can learn what the network portion is on that link, and they can use that to generate their full 128-bit IPv6 address. So if you used Slack, it means that your host can get their IP address without having to use a DHCP server. As well as the router advertisements going out from the router, hosts can also send a router solicitation message to request that information. As well as telling the hosts which subnet to generate their IP address on, the router will also tell the hosts to use itself, the router, as the default gateway. But the original implementation did not support any information other than the default gateway address. I'll speak about that a bit more in a second, but let's first off see what happens here. So let's say that we're looking at PC1 down in the bottom left corner. On R1, we've configured interface FAST2-0 facing the PC with IP address 2001 DB8 zero zero double colon one as soon as you configure that global unicast address on the router it will start sending out router advertisements on that link telling anybody who's interested that the 64-bit network portion of the address there is 2001 db8 zero zero slash 64. 
So if PC1 has been configured to automatically generate its address using Slack, it will learn the network portion of the address and then it will automatically generate the host portion. So that is how Slack works. The router will also tell PC1 that, hey, I am 2001 DB8 one Use me as your default gateway. So when you first see this, you think, great, Slack's a brilliant idea. It means that we don't have to use DHCP anymore. So it's one less thing that can go wrong. We don't have the DHCP server there. Also, we don't need to configure it. And it's a bit more efficient because it's stateless as well. So that's how it seems at first. But the problem, which is kind of unbelievable when you hear it, is that when Slack was designed, there's no mechanism for giving out other information other than the router address. So the PC cannot learn its DNS server from Slack. And obviously DNS is completely critical to networking. We need DNS for networking to work in modern networks. So you're still going to need a DHCP server anyway. Now, there are some standards that are being put in place which will support this additional information, but there's not really widespread support for that yet. So in practice, a DHCP server will still be required to give out additional information like the DNS server. But if the IP address is assigned by Slack and the DNS server is assigned by DHCP, then that does still also result in a stateless configuration because the DHCP server, it's only just sending out the DNS information. It's not tracking which IP address is mapped to which MAC address because it's not giving out the IP addresses, those are being learned by Slack. When a host is using Slack, it's going to send the traffic out using a source address of colon colon. Colon colon is the unspecified address. So when a, a host is going to get its IP address from Slack or from DHCP, it's going to be using that until it gets the normal IPv6 address on there. Because colon colon is unspecified or unknown, it's also used for our default static routes as well. So if you do an IPv6 route to colon colon slash zero, that's equivalent to a route to 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 the default route, in IPv4. Next thing to tell you about is neighbor discovery. Neighbor discovery is the IPv6 version of IPv4's ARP, and it works in a very similar way. But rather than using ARP requests and replies, neighbor discovery uses ICMP neighbor solicitations and neighbor advertisements. They're basically the equivalent of ARP requests and replies. Neighbor solicitation messages are sent to the solicited node multicast address, which reaches all hosts on that subnet. Last thing to tell you about here is a command that we can use to verify our IPv6 neighbors, which is show IPv6 neighbors. So we're using the normal network topology that we've been using throughout the rest of this section. And if I go on R2 and do a show IPv6 neighbors, this is when we haven't generated any traffic to global unicast addresses yet. So let's go back a slide and you'll see that those global unicast addresses beginning 2001 colon db8 colon zero, they have been configured on the routers right now, but we're not generating any traffic with them yet. So when we do the show IPv6 neighbors, I've done that on R2, you'll see that it discovers the link local addresses on R1 and R3, because the routers are gonna be constantly sending out some traffic using those link, link local addresses as the source address. But it won't discover the global unicast addresses until it actually sees some traffic from there. So if I go on to R2, when I first do the show IPv6 addresses, it doesn't see R1's global unicast address, but if I then ping R1's global unicast address to generate some traffic, and then I do a show IPv6 neighbors, you can see down at the bottom in the diagram here, 
but it can see the link local address on R1, it can see the link local address on R3, and it does also report the global unicast address on R1 as well now, because we had some traffic going to it. Okay, so that was it for this lecture. One more lecture to do in this section, where we'll take a look at access control lists in IPv6. See you for that in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.